Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a series of videos from the TikTok account Casby Bartley called The Mind-Blowing Proofs of God. Now this guy is kind of a bottom of the barrel, lowest common denominator apologist, spouting out a bunch of proofs of God that are either flat out not true, or don't really point to the existence of a God even if they were true. When I cover people like this, I often end up with comments about how I'm not actually tackling the good arguments for God. I'm just picking the lowest hanging fruit, there's no point in that. But the thing is, most believers don't rise to the level of sophistication of the better apologetics, which honestly aren't that much better, and which I do cover frequently on my channel. So it's not like I'm avoiding them. Believers in general would just see stuff like this that they think reinforces their belief, and then move on with their lives, perhaps to occasionally pull out something like, oh but they found chariots in the Red Sea when challenged at some point, to spoil one of the arguments that we hear in this video, and then if the person that challenged them points out that we know that those weren't actually chariot wheels, and that even if they were, it doesn't actually prove that the Red Sea was parted, it just proves that chariots got there somehow. Perhaps they were on a ship that sunk. I mean, there's trains at the bottom of the Red Sea. How do you think they got there? They were on a boat, the boat sunk. Anyway, my point is, even after this apologetic is debunked for them, they still have a bunch of other similar things that they vaguely remember hearing that prove the Bible to be true anyway, so they just go on their merry way without having given the matter any more thought than they had previously. And this guy that I'm responding to? He's popular. He's got nearly twice the number of followers on TikTok as Capturing Christianity has on YouTube, and his recent videos all get significantly more views than Cameron's do. Now, I chose Cameron for this comparison because he often has the apologetic heavy hitters on his channel, with William Lane Craig being his most recent guest. I mean, his most recent Christian guest. Apparently he had Alex O'Connor on to talk about crappy things that atheists say. My point is, these might be crappy, easy to dismantle arguments for people who are actually familiar with apologetics, but they are more popular among lay people than the more sophisticated arguments, so they do deserve to be addressed properly too. Anyway, on to the video! This is mind-blowing proof that God is real, part one. I don't know how anyone could not believe in God after watching this. Well, we'll see if I'm a believer by the end of the video. Feel free to bet on the outcome amongst yourselves, but I wouldn't give conversion very good odds. But hey, maybe this guy will finally do the trick. You never know. Now the Bible says that the Lord formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Yep, God made man out of dirt and then made woman out of a man's rib. It actually sounds kind of silly if you ask me. So this means the human body was made from the ground. Now it wasn't found until thousands of years later, but the same 17 elements that make up dirt is the same 17 elements that make up the human body. Okay, before I start looking into this, I do just want to say that, yeah, dirt is at least partly made up of the decomposed remains of living organisms, so it makes sense that the same elements would be present in dirt as are present in these organisms that end up making up dirt. Now obviously different types of soils will contain different mixtures of these elements, but the most common elements are oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, calcium, sodium, magnesium, potassium, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Now I couldn't really find a list of the 17 elements that make up soil like you're saying there are, but I did find a list of 17 elements that are essential for plant growth and reproduction, and yeah, they are all elements that we need as well. I mean. Obviously, because all food chains end with plants at the bottom, so the elemental building blocks of all life kind of have to be there in order for the whole thing to work. But these are not elements that are present in all soil, nor is it a comprehensive list. For instance, silicon is missing from the list. Now, contrary to popular belief, silicon does have a function, not much of one. It plays a small role in bone growth. So my initial instinct with that was to say, well, where's all the silicon in our bodies? But what really clinches this one isn't the function or lack of function of any particular element of soil, it's that if we were literally made out of soil, we'd expect the elements to show up in the same or at least similar proportions. So let's look at that. The most common element in the Earth's crust is oxygen, making up about 46.1% of it. The most common element in the human body is also oxygen but it makes up about 65% of it, so 
half a point. It's the most common in both, but at a different proportion. The second most common element in the Earth's crust is silicon, at 28.2%. For humans, the next element is carbon, at 18.5%. Silicon doesn't even make the list of elements in the human body. Though there definitely is some in there. It's bundled in with the trace elements. But it doesn't even make the top three trace elements, which are iron, fluorine, and zinc. Conversely, carbon doesn't even make the list of elements that are in the Earth's crust, being bundled in with the trace elements that make up 0.2% of that. Now, Next up for the Earth is aluminum, at 8.23%. Next up for humans is hydrogen, at 9.5%. And it goes on like this. You get the idea. The proportions aren't even close to matching up. So there's 12 arguments for the god that we're covering in this video series. Let's put them on a tier list. This one doesn't even come close to actually being an argument for god, so it goes down to F. Massive failure. And we're not going to stop there. I got more. Well, good. I'd have been massively disappointed if you'd ended it there. Now, the Bible says that God put Adam into a deep sleep and actually took the rib from man and created woman. Now, listen to this. It wasn't discovered till thousands of years later, but the rib is the only bone in the body that can actually be taken out and regenerate on its own. Are you sure about that? Because... The article you're showing in your video says right there in the headline that the same could be true for our entire skeleton. I mean, it's also a really shitty article. It's sensationalizing the research for the sake of clicks. The patient in question had a grand total of eight centimeters of one of his ribs removed, and after six months, it showed signs of partial regeneration. Now, they did do an experiment on mice and found that complete rib regeneration was possible, but that leaves us with the question, why would God design mice with the ability to grow new ribs? Did he make all the animals with rib cages in the same way as humans, with the male being made from dirt and the female being made from the rib of the male? If not, why would he build this regenerative quality into other animals as well, rather than only using it on the one species for which it would be required? This seems like a similarity due to evolution, rather than special creation. And why is regeneration for us even needed in the first place? Why couldn't God have just made Adam a new rib right then and there? Why did Adam have to go around for months, potentially years, in pain because of the missing rib, when God just could have poofed another one into him? And for that matter, why did he have to use material from Adam to make Eve in the first place? And if we look at this in conjunction with the previous argument, Shouldn't that mean that women are only made up of the elements found in bone, since they were made of bone originally? At the very least, women and men should have a different proportion of elements in their bodies based on their origins. And I will give him credit for this, the headline does say that it could be true for every bone in the body, but when you actually read the study that turns out to be clickbait. This research is certainly being used to investigate potential treatments for bone disorders, but ribs remain the bones in the body that are the most able to repair themselves. I'll put this one in the A tier, because it's at least based on true facts, though it raises way more questions than it answers. Also keep in mind that this tier graph is relative. I'm only comparing the arguments that we're going to encounter in this video, so if something hits the S tier, that just means it's the best one from these 12, not that it's actually any good. The Bible mentions in Genesis that there once was a city named Sodom and Gomorrah that was full of wickedness. It then goes to say that God rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah because of their wickedness. Archaeologists has now actually went and found the lost city of Sodom and Gomorrah, which the Bible mentioned. This is where it gets mind-blowing. They found out that the city was burned in 98% sulfur. Well, first off, it's not one city called Sodom and Gomorrah. It's two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. The sites that are usually claimed to be Sodom and Gomorrah are, I'm sorry for the pronunciations here, but Bab ed Dra and Numaira. There are numerous problems with this claim. The first and most glaring is that they were destroyed about 250 years apart from one another. The later of the two was destroyed about 200 years before the Sodom and Gomorrah story was supposed to have taken place in the first place. Bab ed Dra also didn't really show signs of violent destruction. It was rapidly abandoned, with some local fires happening here and there, yeah. We don't know why it was rapidly abandoned, but the abandonment happened before the fires, and the fires were nowhere near as widespread as they were at Numaira. Both sites were also too small to have been considered cities. 
As to the 98% sulfur claim, I can't even find that on the biblical archaeology websites. Closest I can find is that there were petroleum and bitumen deposits near the two cities, and those types of deposits are also usually sulfur-rich, and notably are quite common pretty much all through the area. One hypothesis for how the Sodom and Gomorrah story originated is actually that an earthquake caused some bitumen to be ignited and ejected from the earth, falling on the settlement and starting fires all throughout it. I'm not sure how likely this is, but notably this didn't result in the sites being buried in 98% sulfur. It's still just that there are subterranean sulfur deposits nearby. So at the end of the day we have one site that was abandoned for unknown reasons, and one site that was destroyed in a massive fire. Now, considering the fact that massive fires happen sometimes, the Great Fire of London, Chicago, Rome, New York, three times for New York actually, each of these fires destroyed a larger area than was covered by either Numaira or Bab ed Dra, and none of them were caused by God being angry about gay sex. And hey, you know what? I'll give you this one for free. Look into Tel el Hammam sometime. Most scholars place the Sodom and Gomorrah story in the Middle Bronze period, which was between 2166 and 1550 BCE. Tel el Hammam was destroyed sometime around 1650 BCE, so it's in the right time period. And the most likely cause of destruction? Was an airburst caused by an exploding meteor about four kilometers above the surface and had a destructive force of about a thousand times that of the Hiroshima bomb. This caused the city to be pretty much immediately engulfed in flames, and would basically have vaporized every person living in the city at the time. Now, sure, it's not raining sulfur, but it seems like a more plausible origin for the Sodom and Gomorrah story than just a normal fire. Now, I'm going to put this one into the C ranking. It doesn't prove the existence of God, but if I improve the argument for him and go with the Tel el Hammam site instead of the other two, it at least provides some archaeological evidence that somewhat matches the biblical story, and so it potentially moves the Sodom and Gomorrah story out of the complete mythological category and into the still mythological but potentially based on an actual event category. The Bible says in Exodus that God parted the Red Sea, and he parted it for the children of Israel as an escape from Egypt. It then goes to say that after they got across safely, God drowned an entire Egyptian army in the Red Sea. Interestingly, Exodus never identifies the sea as the Red Sea. I have heard it hypothesized by Dr. Joel Baden that the route the Israelites were supposed to have taken out of Egypt would have taken them through the southeast portion of the Mediterranean Sea, which could have dried up due to tides. Of course, this is hypothetical, the event never happened in the first place, so arguing over the location of a mythological event is kind of pointless. Now listen to this. It wasn't found until thousands of years later but there is actually an underwater bridge found in the Red Sea. Now, this took a bit of digging for me to figure out. Ha, good pun, digging, archaeology video, high five. There's a few things to address here. First, in order to fit with the story, this requires a complete reworking of the generally accepted route that the Israelites took out of Egypt, because this has them crossing the Gulf of Aqaba instead of the Suez Gulf, which would then place Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia instead of on the Sinai Peninsula. Again, I don't really care what hypothetical route they took out of Egypt since it never happened to begin with, but this route just seems to make less practical sense than the typically proposed route. Now, fun fact, when I was searching for a map of that route, the best quality one that I could find was from Bible.ca, which has it labeled as Rejected Exodus Route Candidates. So it seems like Christians generally don't like this route either. Second, that depiction of a land bridge is more than a bit misleading. It's not so much a bridge as an area where the gulf is starting to shallow out in general, with another moderately deep spot to the north, but never quite getting as deep as it is just to the south, where it has a spot that is 1.8 kilometers deep. Now, the so-called bridge is at a depth of 800 meters below the water, so that's not exactly convenient. It's also about 8.5 kilometers wide at the shallowest location, and the drop to the deeper location to the north is only at about a 2% grade, so drop isn't exactly a word that I would use to describe it. It's more of a gentle slope, not even a hill. Now, the drop to the deeper portion to the south of this area is a much more intimidating 12% grade. So the land bridge isn't so much a narrow bridge as is being pictured here, but is a gently rising slope as it goes north and then drops off at a steeper but still moderate 12% grade to the south. Here, you know what? I used my amazing Photoshop skills to diagram a cross section of that for you. 
See how prominent this bridge formation is? No, of course you don't, because it's not actually a bridge of any kind. And just for reference, the slope going into this land bridge from the west coast of the Gulf is at about an 11% grade, and coming out on the east side is at about a 15% grade, calculated by dividing the elevation change by the distance traveled and using the legend on the bathymetric or depth map that I've had up while talking about it to measure both distance and elevation. So the drop that the Israelites went through to get from the dry beach to the bottom of the bridge was steeper than the drop from the bridge to the deepest part of the gulf, meaning that if the Israelites could navigate their way onto the bridge, they could pretty much have crossed anywhere, no need for such an underwater structure. Also, there's another reason that map you've got up is being dishonest, is it makes it look like the dry land is at the same level as the bridge structure, when in fact this quote-unquote bridge is actually 800 meters below the surface of the water. It's also got the depths backwards, it's showing the deeper side on the north of the bridge and the shallower side on the south. So whoever made that was not terribly concerned with actually getting things right. Now this bridge couldn't have been seen with the natural eye. The only way you would have known that the bridge was there is if the water was divided into two. But since God is the creator, he knew exactly where to take them so they could cross safely. Well, since we've established that it wasn't really there anyway, I'm going to go ahead and say that this wasn't even an issue. This argument goes to the D tier. It's not quite as bullshit as the elements of dirt argument, as if we were to drain the entire gulf, that probably would be the easiest place to cross, but not by a lot. Like, by a bit, but given that other Christian apologists dismiss this argument because of how ridiculous it would make the Israelites path out of Egypt, I can't really say it's a good argument. Now if that's not enough proof for you, I got more. Now there was some teams that went to go check out this bridge, and let's see what they found. They actually found chariot wheels exactly where the Bible says that God drowned the Egyptian army. Ah yes, the chariot wheels that were found by Ron Wyatt, the definitely not an archaeologist, who somehow made over 100 groundbreaking finds in biblical archaeology in less than 10 years, including such finds as the Ark of the Covenant and a blood sample from Jesus himself. Now, such a large number of such significant discoveries is a feat that anyone who knows anything about how archaeology works would consider not just suspicious, but downright impossible. Like, a lucky archaeologist will make one significant find in their entire career. Now, regarding some of his archaeological finds that happened in Israel, Joel Zayas of the Israel Antiquities Authority said, Mr. Ron Wyatt is neither an archaeologist nor has he ever carried out a legally licensed excavation in Israel or Jerusalem. We are aware of his claims, which border on the absurd, as they have no scientific basis whatsoever, nor have they ever been published in a professional journal. They fall into the category of trash which one finds in tabloids, such as the National Enquirer, Sun, etc. It's amazing that anyone would believe them. Now, of course, being a known fraud who has never carried out a legal excavation in Israel doesn't mean that he didn't find chariot wheels in the Red Sea, but considering the fact that he hasn't published a single one of his finds in any peer-reviewed journal, not even the creationist ones that would be happy to have even the flimsiest of evidence for anything biblical, I'm gonna go ahead and call bullshit on the chariot wheels. Hell, I don't even have to leave the realm of young earth creationism to find people who warn against his work. My favorite creationist geologist, John Baumgartner, wrote a scathing letter in 1996 detailing Wyatt's various dishonest claims, advising someone named Gary, You must be the Gary. Okay, it's actually, it's just Gary. The Gary. Just Gary. You know, just, just, there's no, where's this the coming from? to not trust anything that Wyatt tells him, making sure to perform independent checks of anything he learns from Wyatt. They also found human and horse bones, proving that Exodus did happen and God is real. Okay, putting aside the dubious nature of anything that originates with Ron Wyatt, what would it mean to find chariot wheels, human bones, and horse bones at the bottom of the Red Sea? It would mean that horses and humans died there, and some chariots sank. At best. This means that it might be evidence for an event that was the historical basis for the Exodus story, which is not actually proof of God. But there are more questions here. How many wheels were found? There should be hundreds if they were from the Exodus. Where are they? Why is it so hard to find them when there should be so many of them? Why do they show up encrusted in coral in a manner that is identical to how that type of coral grows naturally? Why did you show a picture that looks like a sunken train of some kind when talking about chariot wheels? 
Remember back when I talked about the train that sunk in the Red Sea? Well, why does that picture turn out to be, indeed, part of a train that was present on the SS Thistlegorm that sunk in the Red Sea in 1941 instead of being chariot wheels? Even if this claim were true, it wouldn't be much in the way of evidence for God. Unfortunately, though, it is 100% bogus. I'm plunking this one down in the F tier. Even giving this the benefit of the doubt, it doesn't get us close to proof of God. The Bible says that God descended on Mount Sinai in the form of fire, and the mountain was full of smoke. So obviously, when fire comes into contact with something, it's going to burn it. So listen to this. Now, archaeologists has actually went and found Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia, and look at the top of the mountain. They found that it was burned. Well, this one's fun for a couple reasons. First, this is of course another Ron Wyatt claim, so I could just dismiss it based on that, but that would be committing the genetic fallacy, so I won't do that. The second is that Wyatt, and most of the others who claim that this is Mount Sinai, incorrectly call it Jabal al-Laz. Jabal al-Laz is a taller mountain that is some seven kilometers north of this particular mountain, which is actually Jabal Makla. And once again, I am aware that I'm probably completely mispronouncing these things. My apologies. It's also in the wrong location to be the biblical Mount Sinai, which is most likely located on the Sinai Peninsula, hence the name. Also, the reason its top is black is not because it was burned by the fire of God, it's just a different type of rock. It's made up of dark colored metamorphic hornfells, to be precise. Contrast that with the lighter colored granite of the rest of the mountain, and it looks like it got a burnt top. But, like, some materials have a darker color than others. A material with a darker color sitting on top of a material with a lighter color does not mean that the darker one was caused by burning it with fire. This is another F-tier argument. So the Bible mentions that God told Moses to strike this rock with his staff so that the water will come pouring out of it for the people that was thirsty there. Also found in Saudi Arabia from archaeologists is a rock that has been struck and then beneath it are smooth indicating water erosion from a river flowing in the past. I'm not even sure I'd want to rate this one as high as F tier. Split rocks can be found anywhere you care to look. Hell, when I was in Boy Scouts, there was an annual camping trip to a place called Split Rock Camp. And according to the Bible, the Israelites spent, at most, a couple of days at that site. There wouldn't be any erosion through the granite of the rock in that short time frame, so we wouldn't even expect to find any erosion on the rock from that. Well, F is as low as it goes, so on to the F tier you go, little rock. Not to also mention that they found the Golden Calf site. That is also mentioned in the Bible. Yeah, there's a few problems with the Golden Calf site. I mean, first and foremost, the Bible doesn't actually say anything about them having drawn pictographs of a calf on anything. It's just that they built one out of gold, so finding pictographs does not necessarily mean that it's a biblical site. But moving on to the more important problems, first, it's supposed to be an altar to the golden calf which Aaron had built, but it's made of boulders that were way too big for any one person to have actually built it. Second, there are animals that are not bovine that are represented on this altar, like the ibex. If we see a cow and say, look, it's a representation of the golden calf of Exodus, then what does that mean for the other animals that are there? Third. Moses came down from Sinai and destroyed the golden calf because it was an idol that was in violation of the commandments that he had just received. Carvings or drawings that represented the idol would also have been idolatrous, and so if the story were true, we wouldn't expect Moses to allow them to continue to exist. So even if we did find the altar, we wouldn't expect to find any visual representation of the idol that was being worshipped at the altar. Fourth, the drawings at this location have been dated to the Neolithic period, which is far too early for the Exodus story. This one also goes to F. I thought we'd have had more variety in the tiers by now. Maybe I'll be nice and bump the chariot wheels up till D, since if they actually were chariot wheels, then they could potentially be evidence for part of the Exodus story, even if they wouldn't be good evidence for it. There, the chariot wheels get a nice little pity bump. There you go. This here is Noah's Ark, and guess what? They found it. Found in Mount Arid by a guy named Ryan Watt. Oh, fuck's sake. God damn it. Lies here a giant boat light structure measured to be the exact length of Noah's Ark that was mentioned in the Bible. On all sides of it, it has ribs like a boat. No natural geological columns form like this. Okay. Let's read what young Earth creationist geologist John Baumgartner had to say about this in his letter to Gary. 
This is the real raw Gary. It's been eating me up inside, keeping the real raw Gary from you. Quote, my reasons for concluding this site has nothing to do with the Ark are based on the geophysical surveys my team has performed in 1987, together with the core drilling we performed in 1988, which revealed a massive ridge inside of the site and aligned with the site's long axis. The ridge actually outcrops the surface over about 40% of the length of the site. The ridge accounts for the stability of the site relative to the surrounding terrain, as well as for its distinctive boat-like shape. The rock material that comprises the ridge matches that in the nearby outcrops, especially that in the road cut above the visitor center. Furthermore, the material Rong claims as petrified wood is nothing but igneous rock of basaltic composition. We have analyzed many samples of it here at our laboratory, and Ron is aware of these analyses. Ron's assertion that I take the position that I do because I am afraid I will lose my job is a falsehood. I am very bold in my creationist convictions here. I'll put this claim in D, for the same reason I put the chariot wheels there. I'm giving it a pity D. Actually, you know what? I'll move it to C because I like that it's shaped like a vagina. I'm giving the vagina a pity D. Oh shit, no, I moved it to C, so that joke doesn't work anymore. <sighs> Damn it. Well, it's safe in the C section now. Okay, okay, I'll stop. They also found man-made fossilized rivets, valves, wedges, and washers at the side. Mm, I'm not going to give these guys a spot on the tier list. Just consider them to be with the Ark. Those aren't rivets and washers. They are black magnetite grains deposited on basalt, and only a couple of them have ever been found. If they were really what Noah used to hold the Ark together, and that site is the Ark site, then thousands of them should have been found. Also, the petrified wood into which they were supposedly drilled is actually basalt, not wood. Now, this right here that you see... These are ancient anchors called drogues. And guess what? They found these ancient anchors around the site. Again, this is included in the Ark argument for tier list purposes. But no, those are not drogue stones. Not only are they not the right shape, and have a hole too close to the top to allow their entire weight to be supported by the small bit of rock that's left above the hole, but they are made out of rock that is local to that area. So unless you think Noah built his ark right there by Mount Ararat, and somehow didn't travel any significant distance during the flood, then these stones were not brought to this location by the ark. Guys, if this ain't enough proof of God, Noah's ark, and the flood, I don't know what is. Well, then clearly, you don't know what is. Because this ain't it. Also, I skipped his bit about marine fossils on Mount Everest. We've seen that claim a bunch of times before, no need to rehash it here. I'll leave a link to a video where I did cover it, though, in case you're interested. So the first thing I just wanted to say was, um, we didn't come from a big battle. Um, yes we did. What? Were you expecting more detail? If he can just say no we didn't without explanation, then I can say yes we did without explanation, and my position's stronger because it's got cosmologists backing it up. We were all created in the image of God. What does that mean exactly? It's not physical, since God apparently doesn't have a physical body, except when he does, but most of the time he doesn't, and apologists for the sake of answering this question like to ignore the times that he does. Well, according to gotquestions.org, which is very much a Christian website designed to answer questions that people have about Christianity, to be made in the image of God is to be set apart from the animals, mentally, morally, and socially. Side note, pretty much every Christian organization discussing this makes a point to mention that the image of God is Imago Dei in Latin, without ever explaining why knowing the Latin would have any impact on the meaning or our ability to comprehend it. It just looks like another bit of apologetic sophistry, where they use fancy-sounding shit for no reason other than to sound fancy. And really, why Latin? It was originally written in Hebrew, so if we're arbitrarily changing languages to sound fancy, shouldn't they all be talking about the Salem Elohim? Anyway, mentally they say that it's our ability to reason and to choose that sets us apart. But birds, other apes, monkeys, dolphins, elephants, cuttlefish, and a bunch of other animals have all shown the ability to make reason-based choices. One of the most basic tests for this is the marshmallow test, which tests an animal's ability to choose not to have a treat now in exchange for a better treat later, which shows the ability to plan for the future and exercise self-control in order to obtain a better outcome. So while we tend to be better at that sort of thing than the animals are, it's not that they are lacking that trait altogether, so you can't really say that that makes us different. 
Same goes for morality. There are moral systems among animals. Moral behavior, including but not limited to offering assistance when there is no gain and sometimes a direct loss for that individual, displays of empathy, such as offering comfort to a fellow member of the species in distress, and an aversion to inequality. They have all been observed in corvids, primates, elephants, dogs, rats, budgies, voles, and more. So we're not exclusive there either. And being social is a trait that is so common throughout the animal kingdom that it's entirely laughable that anyone could say that that's what sets us apart from the other animals. Like, even brainless sea sponges exhibit some rudimentary social behavior. This ain't that special. So none of the traits that show us to be made in the image of God rather than just being another animal actually sets us apart from the animals, as they are all found in other places in the animal kingdom. So what does it mean to be made in the image of God? I don't know, and neither do you. It's just a thing to make us feel special, like we're better than the animals for some reason. That seems to be it. The proof is within your DNA. There is no one quite like you in the world. You are a one of a kind, and you are God's masterpiece. So the fact that every person's DNA is unique is proof of God? Does that mean that the existence of identical twins, triplets, quadruplets, etc., whose DNA is, you guessed it, identical, is proof that God does not exist? Also, like, yeah, taken as a whole, everyone who's not an identical sibling has DNA that is likely completely unique. But that's kind of in the same way that if you take a book, copy it out word for word for the most part, but change just a couple letters throughout it to be different than the original, this new book you've made is technically unique in that it's not the same as the original book, but you can still see the relatedness by comparing the huge segments of the book that are still the same. I'm putting DNA up in the B tier, because while it's definitely not proof of God, it's at least an argument that can't be dismissed simply because it came from Ron Wyatt, so it has to go above the Ron Wyatt arguments pretty much by default. And I've got a couple of those ones on the C tier, so I really have no choice in the matter. Actually, you know what? Fuck that. This is an argument that real apologists use. This is an argument that real scientists sometimes use, like Francis Collins. He's the guy that headed the Human Genome Project. So I think just by virtue of the fact that this guy stumbled on the beginnings of an argument that actual sophisticated apologists use means that this one kind of has to go to the S tier, even if he didn't quite make the argument in as compelling a way as the other apologists. Also, since my tier list is relative, only comparing his arguments and ignoring all else, something has to be the best one. Gotta find that piece of corn in the massive mountain of shit. So if you want real proof that God exists, take a look at yourself. I don't think you want to go there, man. There are so many problems with my body that could have been fixed with a better design, and I'm lucky enough to be in good health. Well, I mean, overall, just ignoring the fact that I had to stop recording in order to have a bunch of coughing fits a bunch of times, that's just normal sickness stuff. Which, yeah, actually, how come God designed our bodies in such a way that their method of fighting off a mild and mostly harmless respiratory virus ends up being so painful? Most symptoms caused by viruses are not actually caused by the virus doing anything. It's our immune system's response that gives us the symptoms. Our immune system is doing what it needs to do to fight it. Could God not think of a better way of fighting off a virus than making you feel like shit for a few days to a few weeks, to sometimes even having a persistent cough for months after all traces of the virus are gone? And yes, I have tested. It's not COVID. It's just a thing that's going around. Probably a rhinovirus. Everyone's heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? Let's talk about them. The Dead Sea Scrolls are a group of manuscripts discovered in 1946. Yes, I have heard of them. And my main question about them is, why are so many of the books found in the Dead Sea Scrolls not considered relevant or important to modern Christians? They ignore all of the apocryphal works that were found there, and focus mostly on the Isaiah Scrolls. Yet, to whomever originally placed those scrolls in those caves, all of these works were important. Why do we ignore the Book of Enoch? Why do we ignore the account of Noah conversing with his father? Or the additional accounts of Abraham's travels in Egypt? Or the war scrolls depicting epic battles between the tribes of Israel, identified as the Sons of Light, and the various other tribes in the area, biblical regulars like the Edomites, Amalekites, Philistines, etc., who are identified as the Sons of Darkness? You'd think Christians would love a good epic battle between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. But no, that one gets ignored as well. The Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs? Nope. Book of Noah? Nope. And I could go on. 
I haven't even gotten through all of the documents found in Cave 1 that Christians ignore, and there were a total of 14 locations where documents that are collectively referred to as the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. They have parts of every book of the Old Testament except for Esther. You know what else they have? Parts of several books that are not in the Old Testament, for some reason, despite obviously being important religious texts in the same culture that wrote the Old Testament. They have been dated back in between 351 and 230 BC. And rocks from Canada have been dated to about 4.28 billion BCE. But I'd be willing to bet that you don't accept those dates as readily as you accept the dates that you think make your case stronger. Okay, well I guess that used a different dating method than the Dead Sea Scrolls would have, so let's stick with carbon dating. We found flutes made out of bone that carbon dated to about 42,000 years ago, or about 40,000 BCE. That's tens of thousands of years older than you think the entire universe is, and it was done in the same method that dated many of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So why do you accept it for the Dead Sea Scrolls, but not for the Bone Flute? That's a rhetorical question, we all know why. Nearly all parts of Isaiah has been found, and it also has Isaiah 53 which prophesied the crucifixion of Jesus. No, it really didn't. If you read it in the broader context of the whole book of Isaiah, the Suffering Servant is very clearly the nation of Israel itself. There's also a bunch of descriptions that don't really fit with Jesus. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. This does not track with the very charismatic preacher that we see throughout the Gospels, who is followed by thousands who want to see him, singing his praises as he enters Jerusalem, climbing trees just to get a glimpse of him, begging him to come to their town or house to heal their loved ones. In Mark, he tries to stay on the down low, telling people to say nothing after he heals them, but he amasses a big following anyway, because people keep talking about him. Then verse 5, which starts out by saying he was pierced for our transgressions, follows it up by saying he was crushed for our iniquities. When was Jesus crushed? The piercing thing could be a reference to crucifixion, though there are many ways to be pierced which don't involve being crucified, but crushed? Even the one act that might be considered being crushed, the breaking of the legs of the crucifixion victims to make sure they die quickly, the book of John goes out of its way to say that they did not do that to Jesus. Back to the book of Isaiah, verse 7 talks about him being silent as he's led to the slaughter. And certainly the gospel authors tried to make it look like he fulfilled that, with the synoptics only having him answer the first question that Pilate asks, followed by him being silent for the rest of the ordeal. But in John, he has quite a long conversation with Pilate, ranging from Pilate trying to ascertain if he was actually guilty of anything, to a philosophical discussion on the nature of truth. So if we want to harmonize the four gospel accounts, Jesus was most definitely not silent while being led to the slaughter. So that one doesn't fit either. They made his grave with the wicked. Well, he was supposedly buried in a tomb that belonged to a member of the Jewish council, who is generally venerated as a good man, so that doesn't fit. Though the next part of the verse does contrast that by also mentioning a rich man in his death. So maybe it does fit? Seems like that one could go either way. Verse 10 then brings us back around to a problem we've already seen by saying it was the will of the Lord to crush him but he was never crushed. Then it says that after he makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring and prolong his days? This sounds like he made an offering which ended his suffering and allowed him to have a long life complete with a family. That doesn't sound like Jesus, unless we're going with Dan Brown's Jesus, but in my experience Christians don't like that one very much. So this chapter fits with the motif found throughout Isaiah if we consider the suffering servant to be the nation of Israel, but if it's Jesus then it abruptly breaks the motif, takes a hard right turn that doesn't make any sense, before then heading right back into the motif in Isaiah 54 with Israel now being God's bride. Now listen to this, Isaiah 53 is forbidden to be read in Jewish synagogues. Tell me, did you think to ask a Jewish person about that one? Because when I look into it, it looks like no, it's not forbidden. This appears to be a myth that comes from the fact that weekly prophetic readings to follow the Jewish calendar do not include Isaiah 53. But the thing is, they don't include most of the book of Isaiah. It's not just 53 that gets omitted. The origin of the weekly prophetic readings goes back to the 2nd century BCE, when King Antiochus, Antiochus, Antiochus outlawed public reading from the Torah. 
Since it was specifically the Torah that was outlawed, which is the first five books of the modern Bible, they began public readings from other portions of scripture that fit the same cycle of themes that were previously read from the Torah. Isaiah 53 was not included because it didn't fit the theme. It was never forbidden or kept a secret or hidden, it just wasn't part of the cycle. But modern Christians, who seem to have a thing for trying to tie themselves to Judaism in the most patronizing and insulting ways, you know, like when they claim that the US was founded on Judeo-Christian values and stick with that story right up until Jewish groups start suing state governments for violating their religious freedom with overly restrictive abortion laws, because Judaism actually requires that the needs of the mother be considered before the needs of the fetus as long as the fetus is still in the womb. Then suddenly the Judeo part of the Judeo-Christian values doesn't look so appealing to them. But anyway, yeah, modern Christians can often be found making claims about various Jewish customs, both modern and historical, without ever consulting anyone Jewish to see whether or not those things are accurate. I mean, you can go to Chabad.org right now, a Jewish site that has the entire Tanakh available to read, and you can look up Isaiah 53. You'd think that if they were trying to hide it, it wouldn't be there. But it is. Here is the exact translation of Isaiah 53 from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Read this. Yeah, so now he displays the Dead Sea Scroll version of Isaiah 53, and there's one thing that I want to point out. This particular translation has been written in a way that makes it clear when there are differences between the traditional text of Isaiah 53 and the version found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, keep in mind, the Dead Sea Scroll version of Isaiah is older than any other manuscript that we have ever found meaning that, temporally speaking, it's closer to the original document than any other manuscript that we have for Isaiah. And not by a little, either. It's by about a thousand years, with the next oldest manuscript being from the 10th century CE, which means that it's possible, likely even, that the Dead Sea Scroll version of Isaiah is more faithful to the original text. Which brings us to verse 9, the one where his grave is made with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. So on this site, the red text indicates words that were not found in the other manuscripts, with the red text that is crossed out being what was on the other manuscripts but is not in the Dead Sea Scroll manuscript. The green words indicate spelling changes that don't actually affect the meaning or translation of the text. So when I brought up verse 9, I mentioned that the rich man thing could kind of fit with the Jesus story if we ignore his grave being with the wicked part of the verse. Well, turns out, in the older, potentially more faithful to the original version of the text, it says that he was with rich people in his death, not a rich man. Now, this is entirely speculation on my part, but as a layperson reading this, it looks like the later manuscripts, which were written after Christianity had been well established for 700 or so years, could have had their text altered to fit more with the Jesus story that they were familiar with. Now, like I said, I am no expert, this is speculation on my part, but this is the sort of thing that Christian scribes were known to do. And interestingly, modern translations of Isaiah that are based on the Masoretic text, which is the text favored by the Jews, with the Christians favoring the Septuagint, translate verse 9 as, and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich his tomb. Again, this pluralizes the rich instead of making it one single rich man. And really, if we look through all the various English translations of the Bible, mostly put together by Christian organizations, we see all sorts of shenanigans going on with this verse, with some having a singular rich man, which I've highlighted in the image in red, others have a plural category of rich people, which is highlighted in orange, and the blue highlights are other various interpretations. And the CEV combines the two categories, saying that he was buried in a tomb among cruel rich people. But you can definitely see the Christian post hoc interpolation happening in this verse. A lot of them seem to be actively rewording it to make it fit with the Joseph of Arimathea story more closely, making it sound like he was assigned a tomb with the wicked, but because he had done no wickedness himself, he was then instead given a tomb with a rich man. Though that particular take does seem to be a minority position among translators. And in my non-scholarly opinion, I feel like the CEV translation is the most faithful to the intentions of the text. That's the one that says he wasn't dishonest or violent, but he was buried in a tomb among cruel rich people. That's kind of how I interpret it when you free it from its archaic and poetic forms. So take that for what it's worth. But this is tangential to the argument being made, it's just a fascinating little inconsistency that allows you to see how translators work their theological views into their translations. Back to the video! It explains the life and crucifixion of Jesus hundreds of years before his birth. Mm, only if you squint at it hard enough and ignore the parts of it that don't. 
Though, again, for this particular list of arguments, this is S-tier material, which isn't saying much, but there you go. Now, you want to hear something else that's crazy? These Dead Sea Scrolls was first found in Cumon by shepherds. Shepherds. Okay. What's your point? Keep that in mind. Why? Are you going to go anywhere with that? These found Dead Sea Scrolls, once again, proves God is real, proves the Bible is real, and the Bible is the written word of God. And that's it. That's the end. No explanation as to why it matters that shepherds found them. I mean, if we want to dig into it, the Bedouin shepherds who found the scrolls were most likely Muslim. I can't find confirmation of that, but statistically speaking, most Bedouins are Muslim, so it's a safe bet. So if it is significant that they were shepherds, wouldn't the fact that they are Muslims be even more significant? As far as the tier list goes, shepherds finding manuscripts where shepherds tend to work is going on the D tier. Unlike most of the arguments on this list, it's at least unequivocally true, so it goes higher than some of them, but it doesn't actually point to the existence of God despite the truth of its claim. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Yoshi Said It, who said, Holy hell, your head shakes so much. Maybe you should have that checked out. This is an older comment, but this particular person semi-regularly comments along these lines on my recent videos too. This is another fun YouTuber milestone for me. I now have someone who follows me around to criticize something about my appearance or mannerisms. Yay! But hey, if you don't like how I move when I talk, then feel free to listen to my videos as a podcast, which can be found at podcast.vicerhino.com. Patrons even get it completely ad-free. I know YouTube still sticks ads on videos that aren't monetized, so the unlisted videos that they get access to a day early probably do run ads, even though I tell YouTube not to. But the patron version of the podcast is actually hosted by Patreon itself, so zero ads go there. And that includes my sponsor spots. I cut those out for patrons as well. Thanks for watching. Thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon and sponsorship manager, and special thanks as always to my patrons. New patron Sengir, and since this is the first video that was fully produced in 2023, I'll give a shout out to my all time top 10 patrons as a special New Year's thank you. AK0700, Fireshard, What Jesus, Jimmy Tux, David Van Vyfaken, Rock Lee, David Schneider MD, Godless Granny, Jan Schunderbreek, and Carson Turnbull. Some of these people have been with me since the first few months that I even had a Patreon account. And of course, thank you as well to all the rest of my patrons, without whom I wouldn't be able to do this. Seriously, without patrons, I'd still make videos, but I wouldn't have the time for the kind of research that I do. Just look at the source list for this one. It's amazing how many more sources you need for critiquing the crap arguments than the do for the good ones. Yeah, but anyway, without the patrons, I would either be significantly less thorough, and so might actually be able to squirt out a video that's not over half an hour every now and then, or I wouldn't be able to do it as frequently. So thank you all so much, from the top level patrons all the way down to the dollar patrons. You all mean so much to me. And if you'd like me to get all gushy while thinking about you, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time! Why do they show up un- Why do they show up encrusted in coral in a manner that is identical to how that type of crow- Why do they show up encrusted in coral in a manner that is identical to how that type of crow- Croral. Why do I want to say croral? It's not croral, it's coral. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Yoshi Said It, who said, Holy hell, you're sh- I can't read it when I'm shaking that much.